This week, Paul and I interviewed John Kinsella, VP of Engineering for Container Security at Qualys. In the news, Instagram aims for GDPR compliance only to leak passwords publicly. Clickjacking on Google's My Account nets a researcher $7,500. And hacking Gmail's UX from from fields. Stay tuned for all that and more on this episode of Application Security Weekly. This is a Security Weekly production. Rapid7 powers the practice of SecOps. Using shared data, analytics, and automated workflows, SecOps unites IT, DevOps, and security teams to make security an outcome of innovation. Rapid7 combines technology, expertise, and advocacy to drive vulnerability management, application security, incident detection, and log management for more than 7,000 organizations worldwide. Power up your SecOps practice with a free trial at rapid7.com forward slash security weekly. Signal Sciences secures the most important web application APIs, and microservices of the world's leading companies, protecting over 7,500 applications and 150 billion production requests per week. Signal Sciences, NextGen WAF, and RASP help companies increase security and maintain site reliability without sacrificing velocity, all at the lowest total cost of ownership. Signal Sciences' patented technology protects any application against any attack with integrations into any DevOps tool chain. Signal Sciences, demand more from your WAF. Learn more at signalsciences.com forward slash PSW. Welcome, everyone, to episode 40, our 41st episode of Application Security Weekly. I am, of course, your host, Keith Hoodlett, and I'm excited to be joined once again by my illustrious co-host, Paul Asadori. Hey, Keith, how's it going? Good, good, good. I'm getting excited for Turkey Day. I'm hosting this year, so I'm going to have a, I don't know, a buffet overflow, uh, if, as it were. So. Oh, that's... <laughs> ah. sorry, I'm, I'm getting punny early. Um, so real quick, just one quick announcement before we jump into the interview with John. If you're interested in quality over quantity and having meaningful conversations instead of just a badge scan, join us April 1st to the 3rd at Disney's Contemporary Resort for InfoSec World 2019, where you can connect and network with like-minded individuals in search of actionable information. Use the registration code OS19-SECWEEK for 15% off the main conference or world pass. And I will say, uh, Orlando in April is my favorite time of year to go to Disney World. So uh, definitely go check that out and join us there. With that being said, John Kinsella is a co-founder and head of product for Layered Insight, a container security startup based in San Francisco, California, recently acquired by Qualys. His 20-year background includes security and network consulting, software development, and data center operations. John is active in Cloud Security Alliance and NIST Container Security Standards Working Groups, is a member of the Apache Software Foundation, and a Linux user since 1992, meaning he is no stranger to Shell. John Kinsella, welcome to the show. Hey, thanks for having me. Yeah, lots of awesome. time with Shell. Uh, uh, you mentioned Orlando. I'm going to be down there and losing track of my calendar. I think it's either three or four weeks for uh, actually with CSA, we're doing a CISO roundtable. So uh, a bunch of conversations with folks talking about containers and what uh, what their pains and needs are. Nice, nice. Uh, and do you know what time of year you're going to be down there? Because it's beautiful, especially in the spring. I love the flower festival they do over at Epcot. That one's actually, I think it's three weeks from now. Um, and I've been down there before at the end of uh, November. And I guess that's what the beginning of hurricane season. Because mm. I remember the last time, I first, when I first got my CISSP in uh, what, 98, 99, I went down to Miami to do the test. And I had uh, Miami Beach all to myself, not a single person <laughs> around. Was... That's funny. Yeah. That's I wanted bad. to, uh, to also uh, congratulate uh, you and the entire team at Layered Insight. It's awesome. Thank you, sir. We're really stoked, yeah. Great. Um, I think Qualys is going to be a really great fit for us. Um, you know, as I talked briefly with Keith about this, if you think about all the data which we're able to get out of what we're doing, which we'll, mm -hmm. we'll talk about that in a few minutes, but bringing that back into the Qualys ecosystem and, and how that can be used by some of their existing tools and stuff, stuff they announced last week down at a QSC in Vegas, their security conference, um, it, it's going to be a lot of fun. Yeah. So I got to ask, and I'm sure many of our listeners are probably wondering, because, you know, this whole new fangled idea of containers for some of us security professionals is, uh, well, newfangled and, and different. Um, how'd you get started in containers and container security? 
Yeah, yeah. And then you'll get the folks who say, there's nothing new here. This has been around for the last 20 years, blah, 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 blah. <laughs> um, I had a slide about that in one of my talks. And yeah, it's if you look back enough in history, I think you'll find some of the original Eklings, and I'm guessing the date here, but it's either the late 70s or early 80s that IBM was doing some stuff that was container-like. Um, then LXC came along, then uh, Google had their LMGTFI, and uh, that was right around the same time that Docker started doing stuff. So we sort of sped up here towards the end. Um, previous life, I was doing uh, um, uh, infrastructure as a service uh, for some customers, and um, we were using Apache Cloud Stack, and I was trying to figure out, could we actually get some of the Cloud Stack management components running in containers uh, to, ben to get some of those benefits, right? And this was... Uh, right around when Docker was starting. So I was looking at LXC at the time. But could we get some of those benefits uh, by having something we could not have to worry about what were the, the, the base pieces we installed on the host, just sort of drop a container image in and run everything in there and worry about what, what version of um, Java it was or um, other components and dependencies and things like that. And at that point, it was a little early. I think I was having issues with some of the um, network drivers. But that was sort of the initial point where I touched base with it. Um, uh, next time was probably a year or two later, we were looking to see if we could run Docker containers inside of CloudStack. So basically running on uh, KVM or um, Xen, right? So we had a little more success with that. Um, they initially were doing, if anyone remembers, they were doing a, uh, a um, come on brain, uh, uh, a union file system when the first versions of Docker were out. And that was... Interesting, okay, again, you had to have specific versions of kernel, so depending, so more sort of, you know, bumps to get smoothed down the road, and then uh, um, a year or two later, one of my co-founders had a suggestion of, hey, there's uh, there's interest in security and what we could do around these container things if you thought about it, and that was about three years ago, so here we are. Nice, nice. Now, in terms of building out Layered Insight, um, talk to me a little bit about you know what what sort of uh, protections it provides for containers and, and for the customers yeah. that are using them. And then uh, for for you know now you've been three years until the acquisition. Um, how did you kind of keep that momentum going? Because I know that Docker is is kind of eaten up the world in the container space. Kubernetes is kind of coming in as the major player now in terms of orchestration layers. Um, you know, this is such a new technology to a lot of people in terms of kind of mainstream use. So how does it work in terms of the technology itself from protection? But then like, where did you get started from and, and where were you at when you got acquired? Yeah, so the starting point, uh, one of my co-founders, Asif, who's been on one of the security weeklies, his original idea from a previous startup was, can we wrap some security around a container? He used to do um, application, mobile application security wrapping was his previous startup. Um, so that's where he came to me and I sort of, that was interesting. And I thought about it and, you know, spend a few weeks at the, at the terminal, as you're mentioning at the shell and sort of figure out what can you do with this container thing. And we came up with the idea of um, actually instrumenting the security logic into the container. So we've, we've figured out some hooks that we're able to use to be able to, to do some low level stuff in there. Um, if you take a step back and, and look both sort of at the industry in general, as well as containers in, in particular. So the, the story I usually tell people, and I, I might've done this on ESW, so if I did, apologies. But if you think about security in general, you have, you know, over the last 20 years, um, uh, come on brain, uh, antivirus, um, anti-spam, all these different band-aids, right? Every time a new technology comes out, you take that same band-aid and you apply it to new things, whether that be PCs or Macs or blade servers or virtual machines or now containers. And one of the things I really wanted to do was how can I take because containers themselves are a fairly new thing, whether you look at either the, the, the version which has been around for 10 years or the version which is we're now familiar with Docker and, and Kubernetes. So how can I take the efficiency and the modularity and the portability of a container and build security into that, right? So what is the end goal of security? Maybe it was sort of my background, so both operational as well as um, hardening and architectural uh, from security points of view. How can I sort of get those components and those ideas into a, a container, so no matter where it goes, that's built in. So that's sort of how we approached it. Um, and you know, in a startup, it's very easy to get that proof of concept going, something which can run on my laptop. And if I type the right commands and cross the fingers right, it'll look good in a demo. And then the next two or three years is actually making that into something which people can use as easily as possible. Um, and I won't lie, we're still going on that path, right? We've got a, a, a good solid release now, but it's continuously making it uh, better and better and better. Um, and then to your last point there around Docker and, and Kubernetes, this is really interesting to us because since, uh, and it wasn't planned originally, this is one of those things we got lucky and we, got a, we, we came up with a pretty neat architecture and the result of that is we're able to do 
a lot of these, these things without reworking it. But what I'm getting at is since we are purely in the container image, uh, so we have two products. We have a, a scan, so looking, it's a static scan looking for known vulnerabilities in the container image. Um, and then there's the runtime security, which is what everyone gets sort of excited about. As we fold into Qualys, we're looking to um, take some of our concepts from the scan side. People really love some of our visualizations. So getting some of those into both the new Qualys reporting package coming out this year, as well as um, improving their existing scan product uh, from both a static and dynamic scan. Uh, their static, their current scan is a little more like what you think of um, sort of like their Qualys agent on anything else, right? It, it, it scans the running container and then reports back. There's pluses and minuses in both ways. So we're looking to see how can we bring all that stuff together. But back to us again, that the layered inside runtime, since we're in that container image, um, I don't care as long as the underlying runtime is OSI compliant. So that could be uh, uh, Rocket, that could be Docker Engine, that could be um, you know some of the newer uh, not as well known. Uh, uh, Google, I believe, has something else out there. If we go over and run that container on Docker for Windows in Linux mode, it's still going to run. Um, so it, it makes it very modular, very easy to run without having to install other kernel modules or other stuff around or worry about what the orchestration is or the runtime run and things like that. I, I have a question based on, on those last comments, John. In Someone was talking about um, Windows support for containers. I think you and I might have spoken about this a, a while back. And like yeah. the way I, I understand Docker primarily, right? And I've always seen it running in a Linux environment. And I know that, you know, Azure has its concept of containers. Like how much does that transfer? Is it basically Linux running on top of Windows or can I spin up a pure Windows container? And if I do, does that run on Windows or does that run on Linux? Like I'm, I'm confused. <laughs> I just haven't, save me yeah. the Google search, right? <laughs> Yeah, so it's 90, about 98% of containers run on uh, Linux. So mm -hmm. what that is, it's you've got a, a Linux host with a kernel, mm -hmm. um, and then you're using a, a kernel namespaces to give each container their own little thing. That's basically what a container is, yep. right? Windows, Docker for, Docker for Windows supports two things. So it supports running that Linux VM, uh, which gets run through Hyper-V, and then it's just, you know, it's, it's the, the Mobi image, and then your containers are running in there like anywhere else. Mm -hmm. uh, the second thing is what you're hitting at is uh, Windows native containers. So in this particular point, what Windows does is they've got a very stripped down version of Windows. Uh, so when you run those, it's got um, a kernel, maybe some command line things, and really nothing else. So the video subsystems, the audio subsystems, a lot of that stuff's been stripped out. Um, and then they've added in some hooks to make it a little bit easier for Docker to be able to launch into it. If you see some of their, um, some of the, if anyone wants to go into that in depth, some of their talks from previous Docker cons, and then again, probably I'm going Docker con EU in that's two weeks from now. Mm -hmm. Like I said, my calendar's busy, but so there's, they've done a lot of really great stuff and, and the way they talk about it and what they've done is their talks are really interesting and go in a lot of depth. So they, Microsoft has not Docker, but some other platform to run containers on and those can be windows or linux containers so it's from my experience it's you're still running docker you're installing docker as a product so docker mm -hmm. for either docker ce nowadays or docker enterprise mm -hmm. um, and then that will run either a linux vm or a windows vm oh, it... so on the well, and... i should say a windows base right and that will then run in there but yeah so you can either run a native windows binary or you can run a Linux binary in a VM. I got you. I got you. So it's it's this way. It's Paul like um, being able to run IIS in a Windows based Docker container. Yep. You know, gotcha. Windows based um, .NET Core or .NET application for a, a web server, and it's again same thing as as what you run with Docker. It's just all streamlined as the most minimum things that you need to actually run that environment uh, for your application. Yeah, the reason I, I ask and my, my interest is we talk a lot about Active Directory insecurity, basically. We work with a lot of open source and commercial solutions to help people secure that. All my pen test friends are preying upon you know Active Directory. And I'm like, it'd be nice to have containers like we do on the Linux side of the house in Windows for security reasons. John, do you, do you agree? Do you see a use case for this? I'm going to be honest. I don't have enough experience with it to say. Um, the idea seems right. I don't think of... At least on the Linux side, a container by itself is not an isolation, mm. uh, not an object of isolation from a security point of view. I believe on the Windows side, it's probably a little bit better done. Um, hmm. It's interesting the way you say it, and, and yeah, I, I, I'm aware of your love for uh, uh, Active Directory security. Mm -hmm. 
I, I think it depends on how you're using AD, right? If you just want to use AD to authenticate the contents of the container, um, or if you want to actually think about putting Active Directory itself in a container, I, I think the, I'm not sure if I'd go down the path of the latter, mm -hmm. but the former sounds like it could be a way to help out. Mm -hmm. So one of the things that um, I, I know Docker has been purported to, again, as one of those container technologies, help a lot of folks with legacy code bases. Uh, what has been your experience so far in terms of companies both adopting the technology in terms of you know writing new stuff versus taking things that were legacy applications, maybe they're in a mainframe or maybe they're on, I don't know, say Windows Server 2003 or an old Linux uh, operating system and moving it into a Docker container. Has that actually happened in your experience? Again, because a lot yeah. of people talk about it and, and there are a lot more people kind of discussing it than necessarily adopting it in the enterprise today. Yeah, so there's a few things there. Um, what, and it, it depends on who the user is of containers. The, the earlier guys who've been using containers for the last, you know, as I said, three, four, five years, um, just thinking about Docker containers, they've been doing a lot more um, either taking microservices like maybe an open source package like Apache or MySQL or those things and clustering them, or they've been usually writing either code from scratch in a modern language like Go, um, or they're doing something which they've taken a relatively modern application and then putting that into a container like say Java or .NET Core. Yeah. Um, that was the state up until about a year ago when Docker came out with um, their modernized um, traditional apps we even wrote it down, a uh, marketing campaign to try and help people get their, I don't want to say legacy, but less than modern applications into, into a containerized environment, right? And then get the benefits of scaling and um, sort of more microservice type co concepts out of that. Uh, additionally, we're seeing now more recently with uh, Microsoft sunsetted Windows 2K3. Uh, so Docker, again, is sort of going after that customer base saying, hey, take your Windows application, run it in a, as we were just saying, a, mm -hmm. uh, um, a, Windows container on a Windows Docker container on a more modern Windows platform. So they're looking to support that as well. Um, the way you mentioned that, one of the things out there, I think it was IBM was marketing one of their larger pieces of big iron to be able to run hundreds of thousands of containers simultaneously. We've heard about that. We've seen the marketing. Uh, anyone I've talked to out in the field sort of goes, yeah, they're not actually using it for that. So it's it, the hmm. capability is there, uh, but to actually scale up in that way in a single machine, people are usually uh, to date doing it, um, and someone out there is going to contradict me, right? But usually people are doing it in a more um, uh, sort of using smaller services like either in a public cloud and running maybe 10 or 20 containers on each and then sort of scaling horizontally. Yeah, it, gotcha, it, gotcha. it's interesting as I, I think about uh, legacy Windows applications, um, I application in general, right? And a lot of people still struggle with this today, but containers doesn't solve the whole picture security wise for me it helps i think in a big way but it doesn't fix any broken code inside the application um totally. and it you know it doesn't help really secure it other than you're maybe not tied to a legacy operating system in order to run it which is i mean that's that's a huge problem i mean that's a good percentage of the problems out there right john yeah and that's sort of um people might be migrating that application over um, and you might be minimizing your uh, your exposure to a degree, but you still need to think about how do you how do you secure that thing in a modern environment, mm. um, in a modern container environment. So is that either, you know, looking at us and, and doing runtime application security, or how do you go about looking at vulnerability scanning what's in that container, um, or looking at the overall state of the network, you know, layers three three through seven. How are you going to do that? How you do layer seven security? at least in my mind, is significantly different in a containerized environment versus virtual machines and things like that, right? I really don't want an IDS running in every container. Mm -hmm. um, and some people are saying that, yeah, we want to put a WAF in. I'm like, no, that's a horrible idea. I don't want 50 WAFs running on my server. Um, so you have to think a little bit differently how you go about that. Um, and, and we're seeing some, some decent experience with customers using our runtime logic or our runtime capabilities in that type of application where they bring something in. One of the use cases out there, which is sort of fun, is um, an app was written, hell, it could be five years ago, say a Java app. Um, well, let's get dangerous and say a Spring app. Uh, and then that was put into a container. Well, no, sorry, that was put into a VM. It's been happily running. Maybe it's doing a marketing site or a small e-commerce site. So it's not getting a lot of development work, right? Over the years past, the team has moved on to other places. Maybe they've left. Maybe they're, they're just doing a different job at that same company. 
Now they come along and they want to containerize that bad boy. And, and yeah, you can containerize it, but no one's looked at the security of that application in the last five years. So what do you do with it? So when they run something like that through our logic, we're able to see, okay, this is exactly what you're touching on the file system. This is what you should be touching. Um, this is the functions you're executing classes and methods in the Java app, and then be able to lock it down to that. So if a new vulnerability is found, um, you've really just hardened the application and you can't even actually execute the, uh, the exploit and get anywhere. I really like that. So there's some hardening that can take place uh, for your legacy applications. Yeah. I'll add on, and I want to get your thoughts on this, that the environments that you can now create are much, much more easy to create more environments. In other words, like I feel like those legacy applications I can visualize in my head. There's this old clunky piece of hardware. It only runs on that operating system on that hardware. If I need to set up a test environment, I got to go get new hardware, spin up new VMs, get more copies of the software, build and deploy it. And that process is very lengthy. Whereas even if I don't update any code, I put it in containers, I can put some hardening around that, just the sheer fact it's in the containers. And I can also spin up a development environment, a QA environment, an additional test environment to test security vulnerabilities, end user acceptance testing way more easily than I could before. Yeah. And that's... Um that's where we start seeing some of the benefits of containers, right? Mm -hmm. It's it's you, there's definitely a little more work up front. Yeah. Um, and that's depending if you're talking about Docker versus Kubernetes could be a lot more work up front. Mm -hmm. um, and just how do you containerize that application the first time and, and the growing pains and learning pains of that. But yeah, we see, um, so at Laird Insight, we still had two separate complete environments. So um, we had our production was say West Coast and staging and development was East Coast. So. Um, just from my operational background, I want to make sure we didn't accidentally run the wrong command in the wrong place. Yep. Uh, but lots of folks are um, using Kubernetes as, as an example. We'll have um, either separate tags for um, uh, how those things are being filtered to uh, separate namespaces for between production and staging. Um, and then, yeah, it, it's, you know, it's, it's once you start adopting that, so you go through the first steps of get the application in a container. And then it's like, okay, now that we have it here, what can we do with it? Okay, we can have staging and production, as you were saying. And then the next step is, okay, well, can we pull out some of that configuration and go closer to, a, as I say, a 12-factor app so that when Kubernetes launches that particular container, same code base, no changes, it passes in different uh, variables or secrets, and it, then that application is able to access the appropriate Again, staging or production database, mm -hmm. uh, logging set to the appropriate mode. Um, you know, maybe your firewalls are updated automatically. Um, maybe for running something like us, how we, which policy we apply to harden that application is going to be different. Mm -hmm. So yeah, you start becoming more and more advanced and sophisticated. Um, but you're able to do it in baby steps, which to me is always a really big deal, right? My, my consultancy background, I'll never just say do these twenty or thirty things, yeah, right? It's like yeah. okay, start with one, do get some basic increments, and and then go through that process. I like changing the, if it's a web application, for example, changing the color of the background in your different staging environments to keep them straight, like yeah. little things like that yeah. help too. Well, remember back, we we're talking Windows, um, in my older Windows days, what we used to do with the servers was the ba the the, desk, the background on the desktop would have the IP address and the server name and the environment written yep. in it too. So you can see it very easily when, you, when you're about desktop in. Mm -hmm. Keith, do you have more questions or I think Keith's muted. Hold on. Sorry, for some reason, this mute button is really happy. Like I click it and then it's like, okay, you're unmuted and then you're muted again. Mm -hmm. um, so I did want to also mention though, it sounds like based on our previous conversation, you're working on providing some sort of standards around uh, container security. I know that you don't have any sort of release dates yet, but can you talk to our audience more about that? Or is that still on the DL? Not on the DL. Um, we originally, uh, a pretty good group of us from both Cloud Security Alliance and NIST were working on um, uh, uh, would have been a NIST SP and an IR on how to do, um, uh, you know, how to secure a, a containerized, an application container was a phrase we we're using. Um, we got the document pretty much complete. We couldn't sort of get over to hump for, you know, all sorts of different reasons. We've been given permission to take that work back to CSA. Um, and we're working on that now in a container security uh, research group is, is the sort of CSA version of that. So we've broken it down into three teams. Um, I think we've got all the guys who are working on it initially. Um, I'm one of the, the leaders on one of those groups. So yeah, we're working through everything from, you know, what is best practices around a lot of these things? So um, how do you, um, 
How do you do those vulnerability scans? What should you be looking for? Should you be running with privileges? How do you configure the host? Um, all these sort of different components and aspects from a CSA point of view, which would then be shared globally. Uh, if anyone out there is interested who is either using containers and wants to use containers, wants to become part of the computer, the uh, giving back to the community, we'd love to hear from you and, and, and join the, the research groups at CSA. Uh, additionally, I'm now um, an editor over at CIS because I'm not busy enough. And so we're working on, a, um, I'm one of the guys now working on the existing Docker bench to get that ready for upcoming releases. Um, and then there's a Kubernetes benchmark out there as well. I'm, I'm trying to get active in there, but you know, as I said, there's only so many cycles in the day. Um, but yeah, so long story short, there's, there's definitely ways you can start getting going both giving back to the community as well as actually learning about containers and how to secure them correctly or properly. Um, you know, the guys I believe at Docker took the CIS benchmark and wrote Docker Bench, so you can run that and it'll actually give you back a report fairly quickly on what's the state of my host. Is that in, in a decent shape to be running containers? And then what's the state of containers that are running in there? Um, you know, do we see applications running as root? Are they running as separate users? Um, do they have know, their API? Like do they have their API exposed to the internet? Because when, when you and I chatted <laughs> previously, I was like, wow, that was, if you expose it to the internet, basically people upload containers really fast. And that seems to be a continuing trend. What, what so I'm glad we're talking about this, right? Because I'd imagine that's a basic thing that Docker has in their config. Like if there's no authentication yeah. on your API and it's exposed, I, I mean, we're seeing that abused every other week. I see a new article or some piece of research that is talking about it. So it's a tricky one to deal with, right? Um, it sounds obvious, especially on the Kubernetes side. Don't put your API out on, on the an API port listener on the, the public internet because mm -hmm. you'll find out in about a day. It's sort of like remember when we used to you know install Windows machines and they're yep. hooked up to, to your local network. I think you were talking a few episodes back about your you had a separate VLAN. Yes. Um, and so it's the same thing. So that's a, on the Kubernetes side. On the Docker side, remember, they're really about ease of use. So they want to make things as easy for someone to get up and going, especially on, on the laptop. So then how do you transition that over to um, when you're doing that in prod with, say, Docker Swarm? So there's a bit better security there, but still it's they have slightly different um, um, intentions in how they, they provide that to customers. So I'm not saying Docker is insecure by default, but some of their defaults might not be quite as tight as, as people would like. But then again, we're seeing that on, on the Kubernetes side too. So it... Um, they're, they're both things you just have to go and look at. Um, Kubernetes has a hell of a lot more um, uh, adjustable uh, uh, knobs to tweak and, and flip and things like that mm -hmm. than, than Docker. Uh, but yeah, it's, it's something you definitely want to look at before you just throw this on the internet. Yeah, it's interesting. That I, I, what I discovered uh, the wrong way, right, was there is really uh, multiple aspects to your uh, now new deployment in containers. And that's, you know, the security of your application, the security of its environment to support your application. But then the underlying architecture of everything is also like brand new. And that needs a layer of security as, as well. It takes a little different getting used to for people. Um, from the point of my personal favorite right now is is to use uh, um, CoreOS as mm -hmm. a base level um, uh, host OS for these uh, environments. Um, the reason why is it's it's a light and nice clean OS. There's uh, very little installed, which doesn't need to be there. Um, on the negative side, you can't even run a kernel module. So that, uh, you know, from our marketing point of view, we go, you know, the other guys can't run in that environment. Uh, from my point of view, it's just um, it, it. There's you're 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 tightened down. It, so it's it's whether it's you know us versus them or just what you want to do. You have to sort of get used to using a a much more minimal environment where. Honestly, their their point of view is they would rather you run a container that has a utility in it than to install that utility in the host operating system. So yeah. it takes people a bit of time to wrap their head around that. I, I was thrown through a loop when I started trying CoreOS. I was like, this. I've been a Linux Unix administrator for a long time, and I'm like, wow, this is way too different for me. I gotta I gotta punt and go to a regular Linux OS first. It uh, like I said, it it go back and give it a try though. Once you get used to it, it's mm. um. It's, it's good and bad, right? The idea of doing automatic updates to your OS can scare the bejesus out of people. Mm -hmm. um, I think they've gotten better with that in some of their tools. Um, but yeah, I think the end results are, you know, if you are able to just drop an OS on a, on a VM, and okay, that's not something you have to worry about. You don't have to worry as much about patch management because there's less thing there to patch. Mm. And then as we were saying, you know, you drop your containers on there and, you know, prod or, or, or dev or what environment you're in is just really based off how you configure that. So it, it becomes... Um, 
much more modular and much easier to, to rebuild uh, once you get it done to right the first time and, and you know, experience the, the nicks, nicks and cuts. Right. But there's definitely a learning curve to it. Mm. So with that, I just want to ask, are you ready for Application Security Weekly's five questions? Bring it on. All right. So what were the specs like on your first computer, and could it run a container? <laughs> um, the container part I wasn't expecting. Specs my first machine. Let's see if anyone wants to guess what it is. 5K RAM and a 6502. Any guesses? Really I'm popular. leaving that to Paul. Big 20. <laughs> Nope. Big 20. So that's where I nice. started. Nice. In. <laughs> Next question. <laughs> so the question is uh, then, what programming language did you learn first? And are you enjoying writing anything today? Yeah. So first one was basic. Um, and then we sort of went on from there. Uh, you know, one of the things I was thinking about as I was thinking about that answer is, so, you know, it's, I dabbled in assembly a little bit um, here and there on the Commodore 64 was my next one. And I tried C, but I couldn't wrap my high school brain around pointers at that point in time. Um, but I remember back from even the VIC-20, Computes Gazette was out at the time and they had program listings for games in the back, which would be in machine code. So, you know, memories of my dad reading off 6A, 3B, 7D, and just me typing in. And, you know, that's how you, get your, your games in if you if you weren't getting them on tape or something, the, the open source of the day. Um, and I got an iPad Pro last week. And, you know, for those not familiar with it now, you know, if you're a, a, an Apple freak like I am, you put your iPhone beside the iPad and in about 45 seconds, it just transfers over all your configuration and you're done. Talk about night and day between those two things. Mm. Um, but so back to the actual programming language. Nowadays, I've been doing a lot of Go. Um, our microservices are written in Go. So there's a, a short learning curve to get used to the language. And then I usually say about six months to sort of get a, a real sense and feel for how things are done in Go. Uh, more recently, I've been playing a little with Rust. Um, I'm sort of looking for excuses for, to use Rust without rewriting some of our code. My, my team wouldn't really like me to start doing that. Mm -hmm. So um, that's sort of where my current interests are. Awesome. Now, the other question, of course, is uh, when it comes to sitting down and writing code, especially on a core OS system, for example, is it VI, Vim, Emacs, or Nano? For me, I'm a, I'm a Vim guy. I'll survive on VI. Um, the most annoying thing in the world. So um, one of the keystrokes I found recently, well, last few years in Bash is um, Control X, Control E to bring your current command into an editor. If you're doing that in some of the default configurations, it'll pop up everyone's favorite nano, and then you can hear me cursing from about two rooms away. Um, but really, if it comes <laughs> to actual coding, coding nowadays itself, it's it's VS Code for me. Nice, same. I'm, I'm uh, then, visual, of course, so. we have to ask yeah. though, since you're writing code these days, spaces or tabs? I don't care, um, and the reason I don't care is, um, you know, we we can. Configure that in in the in whatever editor you're in to do whichever way. What's important to me is that it is enforced as a standard across um, my development team. So what we try to do is have um, commit hooks in place so that as that code is checked in, it gets run through a formatter. So if there's any, say we're a spaces shop, any tabs get converted into spaces or vice versa. So I'm more about um, the conformality and consistency than than one or the other. I love that. And I love how it's basically, you know what, right with whatever you're comfortable with, we're just going to get it on the back end. Um, yeah. That's actually really awesome. Where it gets you is, at least for me, what so we do um, code reviews before we're um, commit code or merge code into a project, right? And that depending on which part of the application it is, which part of the, the system, uh, it takes maybe just one code review or maybe three, depending on how, how sensitive the code is. So at that point, if you're looking at white space, that can get sort of annoying. So that's why we went to the model of, of just enforcing it. There you go. And last question, of course, is what sort of advice would you give to a newcomer in the industry, whether it's uh, coding and using containers or uh, security for that matter? Um, I'd say have fun, you know, at, at least. So I'm, I'm the type of person who um, I learn by doing, I have to get my hands on things. Um, I'm, if, if I'm just reading a book or reading theory, I know for some folks they can do that. My co-founder actually asked if he can read all weekend and I, I can't do that. Um, if I don't get my hands in and dirty and playing with something, that's how I learn. So take that back and, and then think about, you know, let's go through security and, com and containers at the same time really briefly. One is if you're going in security, do you want to attack or defend, right? So that thinks, that makes you think about where do you want to actually start playing? Do you want to start playing with the attack tools and the scan tools and the, excuse me, the research tools? Or are you more interested in how do you harden the box? How do you keep the bad guy out? 
um, where I got one of my starts, you know, back in the day was I saw someone breaking into one of my systems. And then it's like, okay, how, what just happened? How can I go back and track that guy down and, and lock him out? Um, so I sort of learned the defense side initially. I did the, the, the offensive eventually, but um, that was that. And then sort of bringing that back into containers, a lot of the security tools which are out there in the open source uh, community, you're starting to get available in containers, right? So you're when you install these things, right? So if you're installing some of the, um, as I said, research tools, um, you have to have faith in where they're coming from in some cases, right? Some of the more uh, persnickety ones. So that might be something you want to install in a container and, and not uh, molest your host OS, especially on a laptop. If you want a different version of Python or Ruby or what have you installed, so I see a lot of benefit being able to use containers for that type of thing to sort of get in and, and both get the experience and have some good stuff on the resume. Awesome. Awesome. Well, John Kinsella, VP of Engineering for Container Security at Qualys, thank you so much for joining us on Application Security Weekly. Thanks, John. Thanks, guys. I appreciate it. Mahalo. Mahalo. We're going to take a short break and then come back for the news. <laughs>